Welcome to the Dream Life is Real Life podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Hermanson. I know it might seem cheesy or cliche, but if you've got a sleeping giant inside of you, or you just feel like you're made for more, then there's no coincidence you landed here on the Dream Life is Real Life podcast. Listen, as a girl from small town Wisconsin who decided to go all in to her dream life vision, I know how crazy it can feel to chase after wild ideas. Since leaving my nine to five job in academics back in 2015 to becoming a yoga teacher, a life coach, and now a digital nomad currently living in Merida, Mexico with my husband and Labradoodle, I know that all the cheesy cliches are true. I've watched a lot of my dream life become my real life right in front of my eyes. Oh, and I've learned a whole lot about sales, business, and marketing along the way. And I want to share all of that with you. So here you can consider me your friend and mentor as a certified business coach, success trainer, international speaker, author, and copywriter. I've helped hundreds of coaches, and entrepreneurs build, scale, and enjoy their online businesses. So here on the show, you'll find the real people, concrete tactics, and weekly motivation and inspiration to make your dream life your real life. I'm going to let you into the nooks and crannies of these dream lives and dream businesses and offer lots of real talk along the way. Because to be a true leader in whatever you're endeavoring in your life and to create a legacy that you're proud of, you need a tribe lifting you up with you on the journey. And I've made it my mission to be that partner with you. Because after all, we are all in this together. By the way, if you'd like some help improving your business and life, then we just might be able to help. Head on over to dreamlifeisraelite.com to learn more about what we do and how I might be able to personally support you and just continue this conversation in making your dream life your real life. All right, let's get to it. Hey, hey, friends. Today, we are hanging out with Wally Miller, who is a financial coach that helps women and couples design the life they want by using money as a tool to get everything they want. (laughs) She helps high-achieving professionals who feel overwhelmed by debt, budgeting, and saving learn more about how to gain control of their finances and begin building wealth. She focuses, she focuses on helping those who can't imagine working another 30 years and how they can be more optimal with the work and the time that they have now. Woo, Wally, we should have been talking five years ago, six years ago now when I was in my cubicle and literally had that feeling where I looked around and I was like, oh, I am not doing this for 30 years. <laughs> like Everyone around me has just been here. I am not going to be here for that long. Um, but tell me, did you have an experience like that? Were you kind of working in corporate nine to five culture? Or um, have you always been one of those outside of the box types? <laughs> No, I was the total opposite, actually. I was very much a corporate girl. I thought I was going to be at a nine to five forever. I actually was really in a fortunate situation where I loved my job. I loved the people that I worked with. I loved the work environment. I got to travel. I mean, it was bomb. Of course, not every day was bomb. But for the most part, I was really lucky that I enjoyed what I was doing. However, the time came when um, management changed and when management changed, so did the culture of the office and sort of an ideal workplace became a very toxic environment. And that was the realization that, wow, first of all, I was I I was very lucky (laughs) and now I'm probably experiencing what most people experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was a shift for me. Um, And to give a little bit more context, I had gotten into my career when I was pretty young. And so I started making really good money in my 20s. And so I did what most 20 year olds do. I actually was really responsible in paying my bills. Uh, I've tried to stay out of credit card debt. So in my mind, I was good with money. But when I had that experience of I just want to quit my job, I realized that I had no money to live off of. If I skipped one paycheck, maybe I could pay my bills. But if two paychecks didn't come, I was basically going to lose everything that I had worked so hard for. And so not having options really was a wake up call for me. 
Yeah. Yeah. That options piece. And I think that's why a lot of people start side hustles, right? It's like, I'm just like, I want to keep this steady income. I need it. The way my life is built, we rely on it. But now I'm going to start this like side hustle to give myself more options. But the experience that I see in myself and like clients and friends is that no matter if we have that steady income or we start earning additional income or we get to a level in our own businesses, like we still always live right up to that. Like Mm -hmm. when I was working nine to five, it was the same thing. Like, Hey, that's how much I make every month. And like, wherever it went every month, I was just kind of like breaking even. Right. And then in my business, I'm earning more than I did, but I'm spending more than I did. You know? So do you see that phenomenon and where, where can we break that habit and really start to build wealth and not just like live right up to our means? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> you looked ready. Let's hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I totally agree and feel what you're saying because this was my experience and this is what so many of my clients experience, right? So even if you enjoy the work that you're doing, whether it is at a corporate level, nine to five, or if you're an entrepreneur, if you're doing coaching, if you are really enjoy what you're doing, If you are spending every dollar that comes in and you are not saving for the future, we are essentially trapping ourselves into that same cycle, right? Where it's like payday, spend, payday, spend. And so what I do as a financial coach is really help primarily women and couples balance what they want today, right? This is not about deprivation without forfeiting what they are going to need in the future. And I will say many of us probably... Um, don't even relate to the term wealth. Because to me, when I thought of the word wealth, I related it to rich. And I had sort of two ideal people. One, uh, or my definition of wealth, one was the people with the Maseratis, luxury vehicles and the mansions, right? That Those were the rich people. And then wealth was like the old man with the gray yeah. beard, you know, smoking a cigar. And I didn't fit into either one of those things. And I wasn't an actor or an athlete. Yeah. I didn't have any richness or wealth, right? So I really had to define what wealth meant to me. And when I thought about what being wealthy meant, I tried to put aside money. And I said, well, what a rich life means to me, what a full life means to me is to be able to do the things that I enjoy most. So yes, some of that included traveling. I didn't need to stay at five-star luxury hotels, but I was like beyond staying. I didn't need to, um, you know, my, my definition of wealth wasn't, um, you know, buying the luxury vehicles, but I was like beyond, uh, driving a beater. And so I wanted to be able to spend time with my friends, time with my family. And I didn't, you know, I was sort of tired of, of, um, having to ask a boss or a supervisor whether or not I could have time off. And so if we can begin leveraging the money that we make today, have a full life and be intentional. A lot of my spending in my 20s was very mindless. I would go to Target to buy toilet paper and laundry detergent, and I would leave with home decor and pillows and all these little tchotchkes, right? Right. And it was like, I have no intention to buy this stuff. Or I would just stop by Nordstrom Rack or whatever store, right? Uh, In my mind, again, I was in an excessive spender, uh, because I wasn't buying the, you know, $500 pair of jeans, you know, right. but, but it totally adds up. And I think what exactly. I want to just kind of double down on what we're talking about here, about like defining what wealth is for you. Like this, if you don't know the number, then you're just on that hamster wheel of like, I just always have to do more, but do you, so I'm curious if, because one of the things that was really helpful for me is like actually define what wealth means. And some of those things that you said are the same for me. It's like freedom, options, but it's so like loose and woo woo. And so my um, accountant, when we were doing some of this like year forecasting, made me just like guess, how much are you going to spend at Target? If I could go to Target, I miss Target in Mexico, but you know how much like we want to be able to go on dates and just like not and like do that. But it was always just like, "Ah, whatever it is, it is the bill. Okay, it comes and goes, whatever. There's just like always money. It's fluid. But until I started to define like how much money do I actually need to earn in my business to afford what I want? It was like 
okay, great. That's what we're working towards now. It's not just like every month, you know, it's like that, that sort of hamster wheel. So I'm, I want to like ask this question because I think a lot of people listening might have it. If my idea of wealth or my goals are kind of fluid, like I want to feel free. I want to feel abundant. How do we define what wealth means to us? Do we need to find a number or what do you recommend? I say it's the mindset over the math, okay? So now it might sound a little woo-woo when we talk about money mindset, like what does that feel like, right? But really when we think about financial milestones, reaching financial milestones, they're, they're great. But really, as a financial coach, what I'm looking for and what I'm listening for is for you to define to me what your life, what you want your life to look like, right? Because when you say you want to feel free, well, what does that look like to you? Does that mean being able to sleep all day? Does that mean that you want to be able to travel? Does that mean like what what does that mean? And tell me what your lifestyle goals are. And then we just use money as a tool in order to build that. So instead of focusing on, okay, I want to be able to have $50,000 in an emergency fund and I want to be able to uh, be 100% debt free. And those are great milestones. Okay. Having, you know, cash on hand available to you to save and to invest. Awesome. Right. Reaching those financial milestones. But what's most important to me, and it's easier, right? If we can attach a very strong why, why is it important for you to be debt free? Why is it important for you to have X amount of dollars sitting in the bank? When we can really get crystal clear on why those things are important and we attach a a strong, passionate why, then the money will fall in line, right? It's not about saying no. It's not about saying no to, you know, Starbucks and saying no to shopping and saying no to this and saying no to that. It's about saying yes to financial freedom. It's about saying yes to being work optional. It's about saying yes to being financially independent. It's about saying yes to be able to travel with your family without the concern of when you get back from that trip, you're going to have all these credit card statements in the mailbox waiting for you, right? And so when we have that strong, passionate why, the money will fall into place. Yeah, that's such a nuance that I think isn't obvious, but as you so beautifully like break it down, it makes so much sense. Like if we are passionate about finding that why for our businesses, like why did you quit your job? Why do you put yourself through having to learn all these things? Why do you put yourself through rejection and frustration and overwhelm, which I mean, that's a whole nother podcast topic, but it's because you have that strong why. And I, I never thought about it when I thought about kind of like thinking about finances or getting those things organized. Yeah. Having that powerful why will make some of the, for me, it's a difficult, like, I just, I don't know, like money has a lot of emotion to it. Right. And whenever it's like, okay, we're going to look at the books. I'm like, <laughs> right. It's such like a zona of thing. Like I don't, that doesn't, that's not exciting to me making money. I love, but when you have to like look at it and like plan and like use spreadsheets, it's not fun. But <laughs> if I was looking at that as, okay, this is connected to my purpose. This is connected to a big why. Um, does that mean I enjoy spreadsheets more? Does that mean I naturally start saving? Like, where, where does that strong why lead? Yeah. You know, we all know it doesn't matter what country or where in the planet you live. We all know that when there's harvest, right, when things are good, you want to save for that drought season. Uh, and one of the most common things that happens is that as we make more money, we begin to inflate our lifestyle, right? There's a term called lifestyle creep or lifestyle inflation. So the more money we make, all of a sudden, we have more money that we want to spend. And I think if we lose why we are saving, if you don't have that strong reason why of saving, even though you know you're supposed to save, right? Not attaching a goal for why you're saving or that strong, passionate why as to why you're saving can make it really unmotivating, right? Yeah, it's so no fun. Shiny, then shiny objects come up and you're like, oh yeah, we have that. I make that. We can do that. But then it's that same hamster we were talking about and working nine to five and living paycheck to paycheck. It's 
totally that like shiny object thing for me. And that's why my accountant makes me go spread, do spreadsheets. She's like, you can have it, but like, let's plan for it. And like, let's do all of the like forecasting. And I'm like, I'll just manifest it. It'll be, it'll work. You know, the numbers will wash out at the end of the year. And she's like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's clean this up a little bit. Cause I'm totally the like, manifester right like we were talking about before the recording it's just like i'm just gonna call in money and i'm just gonna call in this house but what you're saying here is like having some of those longer term goals to help you make day-to-day decisions is that what i'm hearing yeah it's not only just the day-to-day right we want to make sure that as we are using money right because money isn't good or bad but as you talked about it really is laden with emotions right and so figuring out sort of what your spending triggers are, right? Are you spending because you want some extra convenience? Are you spending because you're nervous and scared and anxious and, you know, shopping makes you feel good? Are you, are you shopping because you think you deserve it? Are you spending money because you're sad? Are you spending money because you're happy and want to celebrate? And so trying to really understand what those spending triggers are is really important. Now, when we think about, okay, how can I gain control of my finances? I want to be an Excel spreadsheet wizard. Well, I'm going to tell you, some people will never be an Excel spreadsheet wizard. And that is 100% okay, right? Um, One of the exercises that I do with my clients is vision boarding. And I will say I was one of those people who didn't really believe in vision boards. But the more and more that I have practiced it, And then I can see that, you know, what I do now literally is on my credit cards, I write little uh, post-it notes about what my credit card um, is either helping me do or not helping me to do, right? So if I had a credit, when I had a credit card balance, I would say, okay, if you use this, you're not going to be able to travel, right? If you use this, you're not going to be able to do this. And that was a really constant reminder of like how I was robbing my future self. Right. And so it's not about not spending money. I tell my clients all the time. I honestly, as a financial coach, I don't care how you spend your money. What I do care about is what your goals are. What is it that you want your life to look like? And I'm going to hold you accountable to that. And sometimes it can seem like it it can take some, a few sessions, right. To really get crystal clear on what it is that we want. Right. Because we can say things like, Oh, I want to feel financially secure. I don't want to be financially just surviving. I want to financially thrive. And it's like, okay, great. Let's start there, but really let's dig in. What would it look like to financially thrive? What would it mean to go beyond just financial survival to financial confidence or uh, financially being financially confident and then feeling financially empowered what would it look like not just to build wealth for me and and my husband uh, but what would it mean to build generational wealth for the kids or my great grandkids or my grandkids right what would it look like then Um, a lot of people Um, I'm a Latina, so we also have to take care of our parents, right? We are our parents' retirement plans. And so it's like, okay, how can I build wealth for myself, but also take care of the past generation and the future generation? And when I, again, you know, um, I mentioned earlier that I couldn't really relate to the term wealth, right? As a millennial, I didn't sit around talking with my friends like, ooh, I want to be wealthy, right? But there was a feeling of security and of confidence that I didn't have that I wanted. And what I learned was how to be able to use wealth in order to do that. And so one of the very first things that we work on is really taking a look at the numbers, right? So many of, especially with my clients, sometimes they think it's worse than it actually is. They're like, oh, I owe six figures in student loan debt and I have credit card debt and I own a car note and this and that and all of this stuff. And then when we look at the numbers, I mean, it might be a little high, right? (laughs) Six figures of student loan debt is high, but it's not as, um, it, you know, I, I, I was just talking to a client with this because she's like, I know I'm just going to just die with debt. And I'm like, well, if you say that, you will. But let's try to figure out a plan so that that is not the case, right? And for some of my clients, being debt free isn't even the goal, right? Mm-hmm. Being financially confident, being financially comfortable, being finan- uh, thriving financially, that's the goal. And so that's what we'll work on. Yeah, it's like having that monster under the bed, 
right? It's like you got a monster under your bed. You're afraid of it. So you don't look at it. You keep it dark. You just like ignore it. You know, maybe you talk to it every now and then, like, don't be mean to me today. But then when you use some of these tools that you're talking about, it's really like a flashlight where you get to go under the scary bed and look around at what is actually going on. Because with anything that we avoid, the story becomes so much bigger and scarier and the monsters get hairier. And so finding those tools, like really looking at the numbers, shedding that light on what's going on, then you know. I mean, this like if you have a dirty attic, like you're just stressed out about how much work you have to do, but you might go up there and realize you already like color coded and labeled way more than you thought and you're in way better shape and you're not that far from, you know, freedom or um, confidence when it comes to not just what's under your bed, but your finances. Why is this so taboo, Wally? Like people can talk about this about weight. People can talk about this, about um, limiting beliefs or, you know, things we believe about ourselves, but why is money this like hairy thing under the bed that we don't want to look at? Like, yeah, you start to like get excited about finding out these things for ourselves. Yeah. So much of what we know about money is learned, right? And actually most of our money mindset actually is built or developed by the time we're between the ages of seven and 10 studies have shown. So when we think about what is going on at the age of seven or 10, particularly us millennials, like let's think about where we were in our lives when we were at that age, right? The great recession, right? Did your parents lose their jobs? Was there stress talking Mm -hmm. about money? There are certain things that we will learn directly from our parents and the people who raised us about money. And then there's the things that we learn indirectly, right? So if your parents sat down with you and showed you how to write in the checkbook, I know my parents didn't, but if you did, you'll write, those are things that you learn directly from your parents. But the things that we learn indirectly from them is when, um, you know, they say, oh, we can't buy that right now. Or maybe the cable gets shut off and you don't really understand why. Or maybe your parents are fighting around money and you don't know exactly what the problem is, but you know, money is the cause of it, right? So there's all of these little uh, uh, things that we pick up, behaviors, habits, relationships that other people have with money that we begin to absorb. And so if you think between the ages of seven to 10, like that is what your money story is. Now think about that person who gets their first job, right? Do they have that scarcity mindset that money is never going to be enough? You're never going to have enough. It's always going to be a struggle. Or perhaps it's even the opposite, right? If your parents had all the money in the world and now you're working a minimum wage job, but you have that mindset of, oh, money is always Flu, you know, is always flowing uh, without really having a plan in place that can also be problematic. And so when we think about money, talking about money, right, it can feel really uncomfortable. I know my parents said, you know, you don't tell people on the outside what's going on at the home, right? You don't <laughs> do your laundry in front of anybody, right? That those are things that we save at home. So we begin to pick up the things that we should and should not talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, I love sort of the movement going on right now where people are sharing their journey to, to beginning to invest and in putting money into their 401k. But I think that there's also some maybe like shame or embarrassment of not even like knowing what a 401k is. Mm -hmm. But why? Like, I don't know about you, but I didn't learn about what a 401k was in high school or in college or after college. Right. Even when they told me, okay, we have access to a 401k. I nodded my head and said, okay, what what am I supposed to do? Right. So sometimes it can feel like, well, should I know how to do this? Should I know what a mutual fund is? Should I know what a Roth IRA is or as an a self-employed person, right? There's even a whole different um, arena. And so there's a little bit of embarrassment. And I'm here to tell you, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You use the tools that you knew how to use in the way that you learned how to use them, right? Mm -hmm. If you never learned anything about this, um, you know, we can't blame ourselves for not knowing any better. But today you can learn and you can... um, uh, uh, you know, everything from YouTube to podcasts to blogs and begin really sort of undertaking those steps to, to, um, to equip yourself to realize, okay, there are some financial tools out there that I am not 100% how to use, but I'm going to learn this one thing. Yeah. For me, it was, you know, I knew saving was important. 
And once I began to attach a, a strong, passionate why, I said, okay, cool, that that's great. But there's like this whole like wealth building thing and like how there's some people who make their money grow. Like, what does that mean? What does passive income mean? What what, yeah. what is investing, right? I equated investing to gambling. I was like, investing is just gambling, right? And it was scary because again, I heard people, the stock market drop and people losing their whole retirement. And it just seemed like a very scary thing for me. Mm-hmm. And so I began to see and understand what was really going on. And so the oh, more yeah. that we can have the conversations about how to negotiate um, whether it's increasing your prices, uh, negotiating with service providers, negotiating your salary, like at, the more we can gain confidence to do those things, the better we are. But how does that happen? By having the conversations. Awareness, right? Back to that flashlight. Okay. So, so many things I want to um, take a look at here. So first and foremost, like look at your numbers, shine the flashlight, like really understand how much debt do you have? How much do you need to earn? Like Mm -hmm. really putting some, um, numbers to it, but then pouring mindset all over those numbers, right? Like you said, I love what you said around, you know, you were doing the best you had with the tools that you knew how to use at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so great. That's what's got this is where we're at right now, but now how can we look at the pattern that you've been running since childhood? What are the emotions? What are the stories? What are the same things that you believe and feel around money? Because it's definitely inside of that story, right? My bookkeeper is always like, I can look at your books and tell you a story (laughs) based on how much you spend and where you spend it and what patterns you run. And then start to educate yourself. I love what you're saying. Just one thing a day. Like I have felt behind crypto since I first heard the word crypto. And it's just like (laughs) not healthy to always be like, oh, I'm behind. Oh, I'm behind. Oh, I'm never, you know, I should have started earlier with that. It's like, well, is that true? What are these other things that are going on that, yeah, I always just feel overwhelmed and behind. But like you said, if I can look at a blog a day, if I can start to dive into a course or work with someone who can help me use and better understand more tools, then I just get to improve, you know, the spreadsheet, <laughs> the numbers where we started with, right? Yeah. And it's also not about the tools, right? Because again, some people will do really good with spreadsheets. Some people will do really good with paper and pen. Some people will do better with an app and sort of automation in that way, right? Because we're not, there's not a lack of financial tools out there, right? That's not why so many people still struggle with this, but it's just like not knowing where to start. And I think this is one of the benefits of sort of having your, your, um, your wise counsel, your, financial group uh, surrounding you because there's a lot of things that we could just ignore um, that is or a lot of things that you might be able to ignore because it's not related to you. One of the things that I hear is like, okay, so what's the difference between like a financial advisor and a financial coach? Do I need a financial advisor? Do I need a financial coach? And, you know, one of the things I know that happened to me was that I wanted to work with someone to help me to like build wealth. And they were like, well, how much, how many, you know, how many dollars in assets do you have? And, and I was like, I don't have any assets. That's why I'm coming to you. <laughs> like, I want to be able to build wealth. And so it felt very um, like disqualifying. I said, well, I want to be able to build wealth. I don't know where to start, but in order to like work with a financial advisor or a financial planner, I have to ask, have X amount of money started. And so some of the things that I would say One is really to get to understand your numbers, right? Know what your income is now, okay? We all want to project like, okay, in six months, I'm going to be making that. But like, think about six months prior, right? What, what on average, how much money did you make in the last six months, 12 months, 18 months, right? Get to understand what your income is. Then really understand what your expenses are. It can be very easy to say, I brought in 10,000, so my expenses are 10,000. But if we don't really understand, okay, Okay, how much of that was essential living expenses, right? The food on the table, the roof over your head, gas in your car, right? Versus how many of that was random trips to Target, random shopping trips on Amazon, you know, on uh, Amazon.com, right? So like really understanding what is your essential expenses and then what are those non-essential expenses? When we're thinking about building wealth and financial independence and really feeling and, and being fine, um, uh, financially thriving is you can get there in sort of two ways. 
One is understand what your expenses are. Spend money on the things that you value most. So this is value aligned spending and cut out everything else, right? So really reduce the expenses. The second way to do that is to increase the income. Now, if you could do both, decrease expenses and increase your income, you're going to accelerate your journey to financial independence. And so this gap between how much money I need and then how much money is left over, well, use that leftover part to begin to fund your dreams, begin to fund the things that are most important to you, to begin to fund. I don't want to work until I'm 65. I want to be able to be work optional by the time I'm 45. How can I do that? And once you can sort of figure out what your numbers are, really get clear on what the numbers are showing you, right? I think you mentioned your accountant said, it's telling me a story, right? For me in my 20s, if you looked at my bank statements, it was saying that I valued clothes and shoes and eating out, right? And it wasn't even like fancy restaurants. It was like ordering takeout and, you know, like some random restaurants. And that's what it was saying that I valued most. When in reality, what I valued most was spending time with my friends, my family and traveling. That is what I valued most, but that's not what my bank accounts were saying. Yeah. Oh, I love that beautiful little bow you just put on this whole present, right? Of how we can leverage mindset numbers and support people like you to really make our dream life, our real life. Gosh, I love when it just falls off my tongue like that. (laughs) So yeah, I I think you gave us so many tangible action steps and places where we can start really getting um, aligned up. Like you said, start making decisions in an aligned way for where we want to be today and in the future. And when we're 65, like it really can all fall into place. So Wally, tell us where can people continue this conversation with you and learn more about the great work that you do? Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation. I do love talking about money, but I know that it can be really hard for some, for others, right? And so I am the founder of Financially Thriving. You can find me at financiallythriving.com, which will connect you to all my socials. Um, I'm most active on Instagram, which is financially underscore thriving. I love a good Instagram shout out. So financially (laughs) underscore thriving. We'll make sure we get links so that people can connect. I love this real, real to real, real person to real person conversation. And I'm sure listeners will appreciate getting a peek into your world over on the gram and listeners. I'll be back next week with another inspiring guest that will help you make your dream life and business your real life. And don't forget to hop on over to dreamlifeisreallife.com slash show for specific goodies that we talked about today and access to continue the conversation with these guests as well as myself. I cannot wait to see what you create. Until next time.